the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce, take wives and have sons and daughters, take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they may bear sons and daughters, multiply there, do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams that they dream. For it's a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I didn't send them, declares the Lord. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I'll visit you. And I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. And then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me, and when you seek me with all your heart. So we're coming to the end of this series called The City that we've been in for the last several weeks, and where we've been learning how God is calling us to be love and engage the city that he's placed us in. We began this city because we wanted to start a dialogue, a discussion of why God has called us to exist in this city. Why here? Why not somewhere else? We don't believe that we're simply supposed to, as a church, just gather together and sing a few songs and hear a sermon and then go home and do our own thing. That's not why we exist. We don't believe that we're just supposed to fill ourselves with head knowledge about all about Scripture, that we know everything about God, but that's it. That's not why we exist. That's not why we were saved. We, also, that we don't believe that we could have been saved and God could have transported us to heaven right away, but he didn't. The fact that we're here this morning, the fact that we're here alive means that God has a plan and a purpose for our lives. And during the course of this series, we've been asking questions and we've been answering questions and we've learned that how does God love our city? And we've learned that God loves our city by blessing our city. He wants to flourish it. He wants to prosper it. He wants to see good things happen in our city. And we talked about who does God use to bless the city, and we said they're broken people, people like you and I who don't have our lives together, who have junk going on in our lives, but God chooses to use us to bless our city, to bless our neighbors, to bless our world. We said that when God visits our city, what's going to look like? It's going to look like Christmas. As we sing the song, Joy to the World, we think about that line that his blessings come far as the curse is found. So that where the curse of sin and sinfulness spreads in our city, that's where God's blessings want to go. That's where the blessings of God want to go. The way that we bless our city, we talked about, we took that word bless and we made it into an acronym. And we said we begin by prayer. We ask people, we ask God, God, who are you calling me to bless? Then we listen to their conversations, hear what's going on in their lives, and then we eat with them, and then we um, serve them, and then we share the story of God's God's story with them. We bless people. And that brings us to today, where I want to put some hands and feet to this, what it will look like for us to live this out in our city. And what I want to talk about this morning is, what is our agenda in this city? What's our agenda? Why do we exist? Why are we here? And when I say the word agenda, you need to realize anyone that ever gives you advice, they have an agenda. Your parents have an agenda. The girl or the guy you're dating, when they're giving you advice, they have an agenda. Your spouse has an agenda. Your employers have an agenda. Anyone that gives you advice has an agenda. And I don't mean that in a negative sense. I don't mean that people are trying to ruin you. I mean that in terms of an agenda, we all have a way that we see the world, and we want other people to perceive the world the same way. Public schools have an agenda. Private schools have an agenda. Businesses have an agenda. Restaurants have an agenda. They want to create good food that you'll love eating, that you'll keep coming back and eating more, and in the process, they want to make a profit. They have an agenda. We all have agenda, agendas. But the issue and the question is, what's our agenda as Christians? So if you're here and you're not a follower of Jesus this morning, the question you should be asking is, why is this church around? Why does this church exist? And if you are a follower of Jesus, 
the question that you need to be asking is, why are we here? Do we just simply gather and go? But is there something bigger than just gathering? We talked about the idea that we're here to bless the city. We use language like revival, that we want to see God bring revival to our city, where change happens. But what else is there? And that's where we are in Jeremiah 29. And here's the context of where Jeremiah is writing to his people. The Israelites have been taken captive by the Babylonians because of their rebellion. They sinned and God judged them and takes this group of people called the Babylonians and he puts them into exile. He takes them captive. The Babylonians come in. They destroy the city. They plunder the city. They just kill the leaders. They capture Jer Jerusalem. They murder the leaders and they take prisoners of war back to Babylon. From God's perspective, this is God disciplining his people for their rebellion against God. And he sends them into exile. But now they're living in Babylon. They're there. They're from Jerusalem, but they're living in this foreign land. And their question is, how are we supposed to live here? What are we supposed to do? And here's Jeremiah sent by God to explain to them what's going on. Here's what's happening. Here's what you're supposed to do. Because a very surprising thing is happening here. The Babylonians had a unique way of operating. A lot of other nations, when they would capture different nations, they would kill the people. But Babylon had a different way of operating. They would take prisoners of war and they would put them in their city and they'd say, hey, go flourish. We'll give you jobs. We'll give you homes. We'll give you land. Go flourish. And we see people like Daniel and the three... Um, the three amigos getting um, burned in, in the fiery furnace, we see them with positions, with power, with authority. The Babylonians say, hey, we want you involved in our culture. We want you ingrained here. We want to influence you. We want to pour into you. We're not going to keep you captive. We're not going to keep you prisoner. So come here. We'll give you a home. We'll give you land. We want you to be influenced. And their thinking is, we're going to make you feel so at home and so welcome that you don't want to go back to where you used to be. You don't want to follow what you used to follow. You don't want to be engaged where you used to be engaged. We want you to love it here so much that you'll forget about your God, you'll forget about your people, you'll forget about your culture, and you'll live here and love here. If you do that, we don't ever have to worry about you rebelling. We don't have to worry about you standing against us because you want to be here. So the Babylonians had this unique way of operating. And some of us in this room, we've come, some, this will resonate with some of us because a lot of us, our parents migrated here from different cultures. And our parents have held on to a lot of stuff from their culture. But for us, for second generation folks like myself, we didn't hold on to everything that our parents held on to. We picked and choosed. We had some stuff that we liked, and there's some stuff we said, you know what, I don't like that stuff. I love what's here. And so we're much more Americanized than we are from wherever we come from. Now we probably divided half and half maybe, but more than likely, our kids are probably going to reject half the things that we like from our culture. And they're going to be much more Americanized where you won't even know other than their skin color where they're from. And so there's, this is what Babylon is doing. They're saying, come here, live here, enjoy this place, enjoy this culture, be a part of this, become one like us. Don't, don't be different. Don't be unique. Don't, be, um, don't follow your God. Don't do your stuff. Be just like us. And that's what the Babylonians are doing. And this shouldn't be surprising because the people of Israel knew exactly what the Babylonians were doing. And some of them got there and they jumped right in. They're like, wow, this is what life is like? And they're absorbed into culture and they're enjoying everything that Babylon has to offer them. And they, they are absorbed by it. They forsake their values and their faiths and their culture and follow after everything that's going on in Babylon. There's always going to be people like that. But what we're dealing with our text is those group of people that say, hey, Something's wrong here. We're people of God. We're supposed to live differently. How are we supposed to live in a culture that says don't be different? How are we supposed to be in a culture that says, hey, everyone's alike? How are we supposed to be in a culture that says, don't be unique, just be normal, be one of us? Do we rebel against it? Do we just give in and conform? And then finally, someone chimes in and says, you know, we're kind of here because of our rebellion and we're punished because of our rebellion. 
maybe we should ask God what we should do. And so Jeremiah pops into the scene and says, here's what God's telling you to do. And what we have in our text is a shocking and surprising statement for two reasons. Number one, it's surprising because it's, it's shocking because of the history of the people of Israel. These are the people of God that have been separated from the rest of the world. And God says, I'm going to make you the proverbial city on the hill. Everyone is supposed to look at you and say, this is what life is supposed to look like. This is what life is supposed to be meant. These are what it's like to live under the gracious and good rule of God. This is how you're supposed to live. We're called to be distinct. We're called to be separate from the rest of the world. And so it's surprising to the people of Israel what God says to them. But it's shocking in the light of the fact that God is telling them these things in the context of the people that have murdered their leaders, in the context of the people who have taken them captive, who have taken them from their homes, have destroyed their homes. And God's saying, in the context of that, this is how I want you to live. And the first thing he says to them, it says, go live your life as if you would live it every day. Live your ordinary life. And he's going to say it a couple times in Jeremiah 29. He's going to say, guys, you're going to be here for 70 years. You're not going anywhere fast. For 70 years, you're going to be stuck here in Babylon. Some of you that are alive listening to Jeremiah are going to be dead by the time you have freedom. Your kids will be the one that ends up going back home. You're here for a while. And while you're here, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go ahead and build a home and live in them. I want you to go plant a garden and eat the fruit of the garden. I want you to take wives and then have sons and daughters, have kids. Take wives for your sons. Give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply. Don't decrease. Go about living life as you normally would be living back home, but now do it here. It sounds like he's telling them, hey, just conform. Just live like everyone else. That's what it sounds like, except when you get to verse 7. So the context is, I want you to live your everyday life as you would live it at home. Get a job, get a family, live there, enjoy life. Here's why, verse 7. You do this in order to seek the welfare of the city where I sent you into exile. The word welfare there can be translated peace or good. The root word is the word shalom, the restoration of all things. This is God, humanity, and creation being rewoven because it has been undone by human sin and sinfulness. So this is the clue for the people. This is a familiar idea to the people of Israel. It's a, this is what God is about. This is the mission of God to restore and renew all things. And now he's going to do it in a completely different way than he's done it before. You know, one of the reasons that God does this is it's a very practical reason. Because this isn't some kind of fairy tale that we're living. He says, the reason I want you to seek the good of the others, of your city, is because when they are blessed and when they're doing well, it's going to be good for you. When you are loving others and you treat them with respect and you treat them with kindness and you love them, your life is going to be okay. See, God doesn't put us into this life and say, hey, now live this kind of fairy tale where everything's just going to be perfect for you. He understands the political reality that they're living in. They are slaves living under the shadow of the most powerful empire in the world. So he says, look, you want things to go good for you? You want to live a long life? You want to be successful? You're probably not in a position to get, in, get your freedom right now. You're probably not in a position to fight. So if you, want to, if you seek their good, you'll be okay. Is this capitulation? Is he telling them to give in and resign? Is he telling them to become part of the Babylonian empire? Not at all. Because this idea of seeking the welfare of the city, seeking the peace of the city, seeking the good of the city, seeking the shalom of the city, has a particular bent toward it. He's saying that here you are walking into a city. These people in this city believe that we should live a good life. That's what they think, that we should live a life that's good. And you believe that we should live a good life. See, what you say and speak is that They want a good life, you want a good life, but how you get that good life is completely different. You both want the good life, but how we get there is completely different. And he isn't telling them to fight and rebel, and he isn't telling them to resign and conform. He's saying, listen, you have a third option to live. 
that when you seek their good and in seeking their good, it will be for your good because we all share this idea of what we want in the world. You don't have to be a follower of Jesus to say, I want to live a peaceful life. You don't have to be a follower of Jesus to say, I want safety and security and comfort. You don't have to be a follower of Jesus to say, I want my kids to grow up in a good environment. We all have a common good that we want. What God is saying is, this is backward and it's going to sound a little weird, but you have been placed in exile, and as you are here, I'm going to further my mission, my mission by making myself famous in the world, by letting these people that are holding you captive, by letting them know that I love them as well. And they're going to know it by the way you treat them. They're going to know it by the way you love them. They're going to know it by the way you respect them. They're going to know that there is a God and this God loves them and they're going to see it through your life. The way the Babylonian people are going to know that I love them is by you living in this city, blessing this city, seeking the welfare of the city, seeking the shalom of the city, seeking their good. And oh, by the way, when you do that, it will be for your good as well. God puts ordinary people to live ordinary lives within the context of the city so that through us, this city can be blessed. That's what God does. And he does that for these people because not only does he love the people of Israel, but he loves the people of Babylon as well. And listen, God isn't going to get away from the fact that this isn't their home. Babylon isn't home. And he isn't going to ignore the evil of the exiles and the treatments that the Babylonians have given the people of Israel. Throughout the book of Jeremiah, you're going to see God saying, they have what's coming for them. I use them to put you into exile, but eventually they will get what they're deserving. And that's lurking in the background when in verse 10 God says, for 70 years, you're going to be here. And when those 70 years are done, I'm going to visit you. I'm going to fulfill my promises. And I'm going to bring you back home. By the way, the real God, the real Jesus, the God of the Bible, not only makes promises, he keeps promises. He doesn't just say something and then forget about it. Whatever he says, he holds on true. Every promise he makes, he keeps. He doesn't have to spin it. He doesn't have to apologize. He doesn't have to lie. He doesn't have to stretch the truth. If he makes a promise, he will keep that promise. He's telling his people, I love you because this is not your home. I'm not going to abandon you. I'm not going to forget you. I'm not going to leave you there to be wiped out. I will be with you. I am coming for you. I'll be with you through this entire time. But there will come a day when I will take you back home. And I made that promise. I will keep my promise. So in verse 11, God says, I haven't forgotten you, and I know the plans I have for you. It's one of the most famous passages in Scripture. These plans are for good, for peace, for shalom, to put everything that is broken back together again. These are plans to give you a future and a hope. You got to understand the context of what he's saying. These are people in exile. You're in exile. But listen, guys, you have a future. You're in exile. But listen, guys, you have a hope. You're in exile. Things aren't going the way you, you're suppo- you thought it would go. But listen, I'm with you. I have a plan for you. I will redeem you. I will restore you. I will be with you. You have a future. You have a hope. This is a God who makes promises. This is a God who keeps promises. And what God is saying to us here in 2014, even though it's a completely different context, but it's the same God in the same kind of situation, God has put you and me in this city to live ordinary lives in order to bless the city, to seek the good of the city because he loves us and he loves this city. We live ordinary, everyday lives because he loves us. With all of the ups and all of the downs, we want to bless the city. We want to see the city flourish because we want the city to know God. So let me help you see our agenda as followers of Jesus. Let me shrink it down this way. Our agenda as followers of Jesus What we want to communicate with our lives and with our words is grace for everyone. Grace for everyone. Because Jesus comes into the world and he doesn't give us what we deserve. We're sinners. We're rebels. We're 
enemies. We deserve nothing but the wrath and the condemnation of God, but he doesn't give that to us. His posture and his bent toward us is that he loves us. We'll get to judgment eventually, but he wants us to see his love, his mercy, and his compassion because Jesus comes to extend grace to us. We have received grace. We haven't got what we deserved. And because he has come for everyone, he didn't just come for a particular group of people. Now, I know you can go all theological on me and we can have that conversation that there is a particular particularity for the love of God that he has for his children that is completely different from his love for the rest of the world. But there is a real love of God for all people. For God so loved the world. He loves all people. And we will do well to remember that, particularly some of us who are nuts about particular theological points, myself included, and want to argue whether God loves us, loves or hates people. Listen, an unbeliever out there is breathing this morning. They, the sun came up on them. The rain is pouring down on them. God loves them. And God wants, his, wants to use you to bless them. So Jesus comes to extend grace and love to everyone. He comes to bring blessing to our world. And what that means is he wants us to extend grace to our city. It means that we are intended to bless our city. We are called to bless everyone. And you know, Jesus didn't come to trick or coerce us. There's a sense in Jesus, he's God. He could just come and say, shut up and obey me. I'm God, I'll destroy you right now. He could have done that. But you see Jesus, and he just leaves an open invitation. Hey, follow me. Let me show you what life is like with me. You see no violence, you see no coercion, you see no trickery, you see no oppression of people to force them to follow him. There's no violence for us in sharing Jesus and praying that, be people, that people become followers of Jesus. There's no oppression of other religions in order to get our way. Instead, what we want to see happen in the public square, in a pluralistic society that we live in, is that we want to see everybody live a good life, whether they believe like us or not. Everyone want to have the good, common good of the people, whether they think like us or not. And listen, let me be honest, all religions are not the same. They're completely different from each other. But what all religions have is a, com is a desire for the common good of all people. This is the world that we want. We want the world to flourish. But from our perspective as believers and followers of Jesus, we believe that we want the good for all people because we're created in God's image. That God intends to bless the world and that because God wants to bless, bless the world, we want to bless the world. And we want everyone to enjoy the life that God intended for them. And what's different about us from other religions or people that don't believe in God is that we have a completely different idea of what that looks like. So Jesus wasn't crazy when he said, hey, do unto others as you would want them to do unto you. And so when it comes to political or religious freedom for people who are different from us, politically or religiously, we want the same thing for them that we want for us. We want to extend grace to all people. <coughs> Can I get that water? Thanks. We're not called just to love people that are like us. We're not called to just love people that think like us. We're not called to just love people that agree with us. We're not called to just love good people. Practically speaking, who is that? Are you good? Am I good? Practically speaking, G Jesus comes in and says, so what if you love good people? So what if you love people that think just like you? So what if you think love people that look like you and act like you and behave like you? And Jesus says, what about those who are your enemies? What about those who could actually probably hurt you? What about those who could actually injure you? Love them. Care for them. Because then the world knows you're different. The world says, hey, let's just divide ourselves into little tribes and in little groups, and it's a power play of who wins. 
hopefully one party will win or the other party will win or one religion will win or the other religion will win. But Jesus says, hey, you don't have to win because I've already won. I am victorious. So you don't have to try to prove yourself. So now we're free to love and we're free to serve. Do you want to know what will change the world for Jesus? When a group of people will be willing to suffer and serve people who aren't part of their tribe, who aren't just like them who will be willing to say, I want to extend grace to everyone even if they will never extend it back to me. And the world will see that and they'll be different. A lot of you guys weren't here two years ago when we did something crazy. We went, I went and talked to the imam at the mosque of Plano and I just said, hey, I'm a pastor here. I want to meet you. And he goes, okay. Um, Thought I was weird. Um, We became friends. Um, We hung out once a month for lunch, started talking. He started asking me theological questions. I started asking him theological questions. um, And we just started building relationships to the point when we began our opening service, I said, hey, we're having an opening service. We'd love for you to come. And he goes, okay. And he shows up. He's here. I'm like, all right, this is kind of weird. And then so we go and following week we have lunch again. And he goes, hey, what do you think if I can bring a handful of my people to your church to see what church is like? what do you say to stuff like that? I'm <laughs> like, okay, come on over. So we had a Sunday two years ago where we had half of our crowd was Muslims, half of our crowds were Christians, and they were singing Amazing Grace with us. And they were listening to our services, and they were listening to the gospel being presented, and then we served them lunch afterward. And those people in that community said, you know, we felt so welcome here. We felt so loved here. And there were relationships that were formed. When we extend grace to all people, whether they are like us or not, because God calls us to bless everyone. See, what we're talking about is in the context of the city, we're talking about a city that's both beautiful and it's broken. Let's be realistic. The city, people, people walked around Jesus for years and they still rejected him. Our city is full of people who have no intention, no desire, no passion to ever follow Jesus on his terms. We shouldn't imagine that somehow if we get this right and if we figure out how best to serve people, that everyone in this city is going to be accepting. That somehow if we do this right, that everyone will love Jesus. We shouldn't imagine that. We aren't saying that through the work we do that the entire world is going to be changed And there isn't going to be any more sadness or sorrow or sin. That's not what we're saying at all. But what we are saying, we're free to try. We're free to try. We're free to love people. Because who knows what God can do through our lives to bless when we bless people. We belong to Jesus. So we can and we should love the people that Jesus loves. And that's everybody. We belong to Jesus, so we should reject what Jesus rejects. And because we belong to Jesus, we can embrace and reconcile and renew and restore the things that are good things, even if they become broken. So we're talking about blessing a city that's not just ugly, but it's also beautiful. And it's not just ugly, it's not all beautiful as well. It is beautiful and broken together. And everything we are is about Jesus. So we have a vision for the good of the city, And our vision of the good of the city is Jesus. And we have a hope for everyone, and our hope is Jesus. And so the challenge and the opportunity for us is to build our lives around Jesus and not just use Jesus as some means for a sociopolitical construct or think that Jesus exists as some kind of spiritual, mystical escape from reality. This is a challenge that we face. Do we go about loving the city and just being engaged in the city and never tell people that God loves them and cares about them? Or do we want to say that, hey, God loves sinners, that, that's good and all, but God really cares more about you and your personal relationship with Jesus, so let's just focus on ourselves and never really care about the city? It's not a either or, it's a both and. The challenge, the message is that God saves sinners and he takes 
uses us to take that message into the world as we bless the city. See, in the end, the message is really simple. It's simple because there are just two issues that we're dealing with, freedom and justice. Christianity deals with the issue of justice, peace on earth, shalom, protection from evil. We deal with freedom, freedom from evil, freedom for good. Again, this is Jesus saying, do unto others as you would want them to do to you. It is freedom to live that way. Ultimately, we do it for his glory, but we also do it for the good of our city. I'm going to step on some of your toes, and some of you might not like what I'm about to say, but there's flexibility to this because we don't have to say it has to be this way or that way. One of the things that we do unwittingly is that we keep saying, and I say we collectively as Christians, we keep talking about how we have forgotten that we are a Christian nation. Can I ask you what that means? Does it mean we're Anglican? Does it mean we're Baptist? Does it mean we're Pentecostal? Does it mean that we're a certain denomination, that we believe certain things? And can I ask you, does it even matter? whether we're a Christian nation or not. You might, not. you might notice when you walk through the history of the world that Christianity flourished in multiple government systems. It flourished in monarchies. It flourished in republics. It flourished in democracies. And it flourished better in places where it wasn't Christians running the whole thing. In fact, the entire Roman Empire collapsed when Christianity took over. We don't do a good job in the political realm. That's not where God has called us to take over. God called us to love people, to embrace people. So I'm not sure why we're concerned about being in control and dominating and having things our way because we live in a pluralistic society that says there are people of different races and different religions and we can put, allow everyone to put their cards on the table even if they don't believe the same thing as us. From our perspective, if we're going to do that, if we're going to be doing what we should do, we should be fighting to make sure that everybody's voices are heard and every religion is respected. And we have to believe that the power of the Holy Spirit is more than powerful enough to persuade, convince, influence through His power, not through political systems, not through coercion. We don't have to force people to follow Jesus. We've got to believe that Jesus is more than able to change hearts. What does that mean for you? If you're not a Christian in this room or watching, my guess is that at some point in your life, you have felt threatened by Christianity, especially if you live here in the South. If it helps, and I do mean this, as a pastor, I apologize for that. Because people that have agendas that want to beat the Bible into you often don't understand the Bible themselves and often don't understand how things are supposed to go. So I want to apologize if you've ever felt threatened by Christianity. But I'd also ask you to give a second chance. And here's what I'm asking in particular. That you and I should both assume that we're out for the common good. That we both have a vision of how life is supposed to be. We want peace. We want safety. We want security. We both have a life that we want. And what I'm after is not after the life that you want. But I want to Go underneath the life that you want. Because we'll all disagree of how we get there, even as we agree of this vision that we want our city to be blessed. So if you're a Christian, can I just say that we're going to see how some of this is different. Let's assume this idea that everyone in this room wants our city to flourish. We all do. None of us sit here and say, oh, I hope the city gets destroyed one day. None of us do that. But we're going to have different ideas of how we get there. With people outside of the church, let me say this, with people inside the church. If I took a survey of you guys this morning, there'll be people in this room that will lean toward Republican ideologies. And, if, and there will be a ton of you that will lean toward Democratic ideologies. You both want the same thing. You both want what is good for people. 
You just have different perspectives of how you get there. Our ways of getting there are different, but we want people to flourish. We have different ways of going after the same thing. Can we adopt a posture that says that we can come alongside and affirm that we all want the same thing? We want what is good for each other. We want everybody to flourish. We want everyone to prosper. So we don't have to say, this is how you're supposed to think. We can just say, we want to bless the city. So then the way that we deal with this question as a believer of what's wrong, why isn't things working, why isn't things going the way we want it to go, why isn't things flourishing, we as believers, as followers of Jesus, we can say the reason things aren't flourishing, the reason things aren't going well is because we live in a broken world. Not because politics can't figure out, it's because we're broken. People are broken, society is broken, institution is broken, culture is broken, we're broken. And when we bring this to the table as Christians, to the question of why things aren't going the way that they should be, the reason they aren't going the way things are going the way it should be is because we are sinful people. We do sinful things. We try to play God. We believe that God has a design for the world. We believe that God has a plan for the world. The problem is that we try to think that we are smarter than God. Every single one of us on some level or another walk in and play by our own rules instead of God's rules. And we attempt to solve the world's problems our own ways. I'm going to play God, and that's why the world is broken. We want things to go well for everyone, but we have to admit that we're the reason things are broken. We're the reason things aren't going the way it's supposed to be. That means this. This puts us in a position where ultimately we put no hope in any political party, because no political party can fix the brokenness of human sinfulness. No political party can get this back together. That's why what we can do, and as a church, what we're called to is in the public square, we call them to admire the work of Jesus through our lives and through our words. And we see what Jesus is doing in our city. We watch what he does. It will not be our intelligence. It will not be about our persuasiveness. It will be about the work of the God of the universe who has love and mercy and compassion for our city. And we get to join him in that work and admire what God is doing because it is all about Jesus. That is what we have to say to this city. That is what we have to show to this city. See what this looks like for us at the end of the day? is we want our city to know that there's a God and that he loves them. That's the unique role that we play as a church. That's why we're here. Because we want this city to know God exists, God loves you. We believe that God has called us to disciple people to do that where you're called to be. Not just in the context of church, but where you work. To show people God exists, God loves you. Where you go to school, God exists, God loves you. In your family, God exists, God loves you. We want to disciple you so that you will live this out where people will see God exists, God loves you. This is what we're called to be. Some of you have the desire and the capability to do great good in this city, and we want to do everything we can to get behind you and encourage you. We want to equip you. We want to empower you to the unique place where you can call people back to God and call them to follow Jesus in our city. That's, <coughs> oh, excuse me. That is what we do as followers of Jesus. We equip for the sake of the city. To be a church like that, we need Jesus. He is our message. Listen, if we as a church ever stop talking about Jesus, if we ever, if Jesus ever stops being front and center of what we do, we've lost our vision. We've lost what we're about. I like that we say that we're family, and I hope that's your experience here. I hope you feel welcome. I love that we talk about mission and we're engaged in that. But ultimately, what I want for you and what I want for me is that, that you know that you belong to Jesus, that he loves you, that he cares for you. But Jesus isn't just our message, he's also our motivation. We will not, by God's grace, become a people driven to do more and try harder. It's never gonna be about guilt or condemnation or judgment. 
My hope and my prayer is that our message will always be a message of grace. It will always be a message of the gospel. Because he lived and loved you, you can now love people and you can truly live. We're not going to say he loves you, he loves you, he loves you and never have anything to do underneath that. Because the message of the gospel is throughout scriptures and you find it even here in Jeremiah 29. Where do you see it? You see it in verse 12. Verse 11, God says, I have a plan for your future. But in verse 12, he says, and then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. You look at those two verses and you see hope and a future because God ultimately wants to bless us, not financially or physically, but he wants to bless us with himself. He says, when you call me, I will come to you. When you seek me, you will find me. The ultimate way that God blesses us is by giving us himself. I can know Jesus. I can be loved by him because if I call on him, he will come to me. If I pray, he will hear me. If I seek him, he will find me. But there's a problem because verse 12 says, when you seek me with all your heart. Any one of us do that 24-7, 365? If you are, you probably should be up here, not me, because we don't. So what's our choice? We can lower the bar. Oh, that word all doesn't really mean all. I mean, it just means do your best at it. Or we can try to jump as high as possible and work hard. Remember the definition of sin that we talked about? It's us trying to play God and make our own rules and define just try to solve our own problems. If that's our only choice, then our only choice is to respond to God in sin. If it's not going to be all my heart that I, he's going to hear me and he's going to find me, then what kind of choice is that? See, the good news, let me close with this, is that God saves sinners. You can look at that line that says, when you seek me with all your heart, and you can know that there is one who did. He came to earth. He lived a life that sought his father's heart 24-7, 365. He sought it with all of his heart, with all of his soul, with all of his mind, with all of his strength. And because of the grace of God, his love for his father has now been given to you. So that now, God who says, love me with all of your heart, pray to me and I will hear you, seek me and you will find me. If you belong to Jesus, when the father sees you, he sees someone who has loved him with all of his heart because when he sees you, he sees Jesus. So now you're free. He loves you. So you can call on him. And because you are engulfed with Jesus, when you call on him, he will hear you. When you seek him, you will find him. When you pray to him, he will listen. He loves you. You're free from having to prove yourself to him. You're free from having to prove yourself to other people. So let me ask you, if that is true, if God loves you, what can stop you? What can stop you? What do you have to worry about? If you know God loves you, what do you have to fear? Who do you have to be afraid of? If you know that in his love, he will take care of you, where should you be afraid to go? Who should you be afraid to love? The almighty God of the universe loves you. Every Sunday here at Loft City, we end by coming back to the table. And we do that specifically for a reason. Number one, to remind us of his great love for us that it wasn't because of what we did that we're here. It's because Jesus loves us. To remind us 
that if he loved us and was willing to die for us, that he's faithful enough to finish what he started in us. He's still working in us. He's still making us more like him. But in the context of this series, the table also reminds us that we're called to extend his love to the world around us. Because in a few moments, each of you will gather the elements and go back to your seats. There's going to be elements that are remaining. And those remaining elements speak to us this morning because it reminds us that there are people in our lives, friends, family, co-workers, classmates, that don't know Jesus yet. But in God's sovereignty and plan, he has put you into their lives. That if you would go with the confidence that God loves you, that you have nothing to fear, maybe God will use you to bring them to Jesus. And who knows, one day they could partake of the table with us as brothers and sisters of Jesus. So when you grab the elements this morning, be reminded of how much God loves you. And as you are reminded of that, be reminded that you can do anything because he'll take care of you. He will be with you. Would you pray with me? Father, this morning would your Holy Spirit remind us your great love for us. Would you remind us that we belong to Jesus so we have nothing to fear. We can love this city. We can love our neighbors. We can love people that are different from us because we know that you don't just say a few words when you say you love us. When you love us, you are with us every step of the way. You will protect. You will provide. You will guide. And so as we come to the table this morning, we recognize that there is nothing good in us that allows us to partake of this table. But everything that we are, everything that we have, everything we ever will be is only because of your grace through the work of your Son when he gave his life for us. So God, we come humbly, but we also come boldly because we know you will not abandon us. We love you.